Good morning, brothers and sisters. This is your brother, Chris LaSala, coming to you from BDS in Corsicana, Texas. In this video, I'm going to be going over the heretical satanic teachings of Andrew Womack. I know that's a shocking statement for some of you who follow Andrew Womack, but I can assure you it's completely true. I'm going to be going over a lot of his teachings in this video. Everything I talk about is going to be dealt with in context, uh, in line with the way he was presenting his message. I know many of his uh, little idolaters are going to come back in this video and try and say I took his stuff out of context. I didn't. I am a pastor in Texas. I am not just some fool grabbing his clips off the internet and misusing them. I am going to be presenting you with serious, serious false doctrines that this man is teaching. Now, I know he appears to be this little Bible Belt sweetheart with a big belt buckle and little Texas drawl, and everybody really likes his, you know, his accent, and, you know, the older generation thinks he's just the greatest man of God since sliced bread, but this man's no different than Kenneth Copeland, Creflo Dollar, and Joseph Prince and all the other bogus word of faith teachers that are out there today that are raking in multi-millions of dollars. And in this video, you're actually going to see he's friends with most of the men I just mentioned and many other word of faith teachers that I'm going to present to you uh, in this video right here. But I would like to get into what the man teaches and why I'm making this video. This is going to be a quick summary for those of you who just don't want to stomach the whole video, but I'm going to go into what this man teaches that's completely unbiblical and false, and it's nothing but a bunch of lies to make you feel good and remain comfortable in your lukewarm Christian walk and remain in your sin. So here we go. Andrew Womack teaches that every Christian already has everything they need in Christ as soon as they believe. This is not biblical. Andrew Womack teaches God forgives past, present, and future sins. This is not biblical. Andrew Womack teaches if believers go on willfully sinning, that they will receive eternal life, and that there will be no condemnation from God for their sins, but only condemnation in the world from the authorities like the police or, or the devil and the demons in this world. Andrew Womack teaches we can claim what we want from God. Andrew Womack teaches that God wants everyone to prosper financially. Andrew Womack teaches real Christians that have real faith never need to be sick. That is not biblical. That's far from biblical. Not only that, it's a doctrine of novices that have only been Christians for like one or two years. Andrew Womack teaches born-again Christians no longer have a sin nature, that they have been delivered from the flesh. So that whole, you know, flesh lusting against the spirit situation, that's just a big mistake according to Andrew Womack. That shouldn't even be in the Bible. Because you're already set free of that. You have no sin nature. And now you just ask God for, you know, wealth and prosperity. And that's all you have to worry about. He also teaches God never makes people sick for his own purposes. He also teaches God will answer your prayers even when you live in sin. And that is far from biblical. Now, this is a big deal, people. If you believe all these things that I just said, you are very deceived. If you're sending this man money, you are very deceived. This man has boasted that he's taking in upwards of $60 million a year to spread these false doctrines. And in some of the teachings I'm going to show you, he doesn't even want to go into verifying the things that are coming out of his mouth. And he calls his teachings andeology. Basically, he's teaching you his own opinion. This cheap grace uh, word of faith garbage is spreading like a disease through the body of Christ. I know beyond any doubt, I'm 100% certain this is a doctrine of demons. Now, I want to get into the teachings 
and I'm going to do my commentary as we go along. So let's get started. Let's go right into what this man's been saying, and you could judge for yourself. And when you look at this, try and put your preconceived notions down and actually listen to what I'm saying and listen to the scriptures I'm presenting. I am going to be presenting boatloads of scripture in this video. I'm doing this because I love people. I'm not doing this because I hate Andrew Womack. I'm doing this because if people believe in what Andrew Womack is teaching, they are literally going to go to hell. You need to take this walk seriously. You need to take what the Bible says seriously. Don't trust any man. Take what he's saying to the Bible. That's what we're going to do in this video. So let's take a look. This fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Faith is a fruit of the Spirit. Meekness and temperance. You've already got all of these things. You don't need God to give you faith. You don't need God to give you joy. You don't need God to give you peace or love. Here Andrew says we don't need God for any of these things. Yet in the Bible, there were people that were saying, Lord, I believe. Help mine unbelief. People were asking God for more faith in the Bible. I don't know what this guy's talking about. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. You don't need God to give you faith. You don't need God to give you joy. You don't need God to give you peace or love. It's all in there. You've already got this. And the problem is we're saying, oh God, I just need to love this person. Would you please give me love? And instead of swip, flipping the switch and releasing what you've got, you approach God as if you have nothing and you're just begging him. All of these things come from God. None of these things are in us outside of the fact that we got them from him. And we need to rely on him for the greater gifts. The Bible says earnestly covet the greater gifts. In fact, let me pull that scripture up right now. I'm going to pull it up right now. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 12, 27, 31 says, Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, Thirdly, teachers, after that, workers of miracles, some with the gifts of healing, some governments, some diversities, some tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing? And the answer is clearly implied that it would be no, that we don't all have the gifts of healing. Do all speak with tongues? The answer is clearly no, we all don't speak with tongues. Do all interpret? The answer is clearly no, we don't all interpret. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. You see, God said to whom much is given, much is expected, right? And if you're faithful with few things, he'll make you the Lord over many things. There are certain gifts God can't give you until you show yourself uh, trustworthy with the gifts that you've already been given by God. But this verse here in 1 Corinthians, or the, this grouping of verses, is very clear that we don't have all the gifts. We don't have everything we need, and we need to earnestly covet the greater gifts. So why is there a whole stadium of people listening to this guy and not rebuking the lies that he's teaching. Because when he teaches you this, you don't really feel like you need to seek God for these things, but you feel like you're your own little God that all of this stuff already exists in you. And that's a big problem. That's going to make you delusional, and that's going to make you prideful. And if you've fallen into this deception, you should repent right now. And let God know you do need to seek him for all these things. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. 
If you're not constantly drawing onto him, knocking so he could open that door, all that good stuff, asking him for a fish so he doesn't give you a snake, if you're not constantly doing all of that, the Lord can take away. That's just the way it is. All good gifts come down from the Father of lights. Let's keep listening. This is another great revelation about God, is that He is not holding your sins against you. This is another great revelation about God, is that He is not holding your sins against you. And brothers and sisters, the vast majority of the body of Christ does not understand this. The vast majority of Christ believes that God is dealing with them according to their sins. <clears throat> and there's different degrees of this. Some people will believe that any sin in your life, God won't answer your prayers if you have any sin and they will just sit there and make you feel so depressed and so discouraged because your own heart will condemn you and recognize that you're falling short. And I have met hundreds, probably thousands of people who knew that God exists. They had had a touch from God, but they just couldn't live perfectly and they thought they had to be perfect before God would answer their prayers and they just finally despaired of it and went the other direction, not because they didn't believe that God exists. They just thought, there's no way I can meet this standard. Okay, right here, Andrew Womack creates a straw man in order to make his lies seem true. I have never met a Christian who thought they needed to be perfect for God to hear their prayers. He's just saying that so he could try to prove that you don't even need to be walking right and God will hear your prayers. But the truth is actually in the Bible. The Bible's very clear that we need to be doing God's will and walking in obedience for him to hear our prayers. Doesn't say we need to be perfect, but we need to be obeying his voice and doing everything we can to please him. John 9.31 says, We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does God's will, then God will hear him. James 5.16 says, The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous avail much. 1 Peter says, Likewise, Ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto your wives as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, so your prayers will not be hindered. Andrew Womack pretends like that's not even supposed to be in the Bible. That you could just, you know, just goof around, treat your wife however you want, and God will still hear your prayers. 1 John 3.22 says, and whatsoever we ask, we receive it of him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. So I'm really not sure why Andrew Womack is teaching that God answers all prayers. It makes no sense. But then there's other people that believe, well, you won't go to hell. You won't necessarily be hated by God, but he won't answer your prayers. He won't bless you. He won't use you. But this verse says that he does not impute our trespasses unto us. And again, I've got probably, I don't know, 20 or 30 hours worth of teaching on this one thing, how that all of our sins have been atoned for, past, present, and even future sins. How that all of our sins have been atoned for, past, present, and even future sins. Sins you hadn't even committed yet have been put upon the Lord Jesus, and He forgave you of sins that you haven't even committed yet. And He forgave you of sins that you haven't even committed yet. And I know somebody's thinking, how can God forgive a sin before I commit it? You better pray that He can. <laughs> because He only died for your sins one time 2,000 years ago, and if He can't forgive sins before you commit them, then you can't be forgiven. He can forgive sin. Your sins have been forgiven. He can forgive sin. Your sins have been forgiven. He can forgive sin. Your sins have been forgiven. Right here, the false identity teacher, Andrew Womack, tells a stadium filled with thousands of people that their sins have been forgiven. But guess what he didn't do? 
He didn't have a conversation with any of them, wondering, you know, hey, how's your walk going? Are you a masturbator? Are you a fornicator? Do you watch pornography? He didn't do that, but he told them their sins were forgiven. Two, he didn't check if there's any genuine fruits of repentance in their life. So how was he telling them that their sins were forgiven? John, John the Baptist, he was looking for people to have fruits of repentance or he wouldn't even baptize them. This guy is sending people to heaven, thousands of people that he doesn't even know on a personal level, telling them that God forgave all their sins already. Can somebody tell me how that makes sense to be preaching that to a room full of strangers that you never met before? Because I'm really confused because the way I see the Bible, we're supposed to look for fruits of repentance we're supposed to be patient with people, wash them with the water of the word. We're supposed to forgive them when they repent. We're not supposed to just forgive every one of all their sins without making sure all that stuff's going on. That's, that's not how Christianity works. And this is the problem with these false teachers, these word of faith teachers. All they do is preach good news. And they've created this paradigm where people could come to a venue and feel comfortable in their lukewarm Christianity. People love going in there and hearing that all their sins have been forgiven. 90% of the people in that room are going to go home and live like devils. And everybody even that's sitting there knows that. Everybody knows that. You need to deny your flesh. This guy's teaching people they don't even have to worry about their flesh anymore. You better pray that he can. Because he only died for your sins one time 2,000 years ago. And if he can't forgive sins before you commit them, then you can't be forgiven. Here he says Jesus Christ will forgive all our sins before we commit them. Even after we've come to the knowledge of the truth, we can sin willfully. That's what he's teaching. That is not biblical. That is heresy. That creates a defiled body, a defiled church of Jesus Christ. Let's read Romans chapter 6. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under the grace of God? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey? Whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart from, of that doctrine which was delivered unto you. Being then made free from sin, therefore you're no longer a sinner. So you're being made free from sin, yet, and I'm not teaching that you're going to be perfect, but you're not going to sin willfully after that point. There's going to be sins of the flesh that you do that later you will repent for and you will grow out of them, but you will not willfully be sinning. So you're made free from sin. You became the servants of righteousness. So with your will, you're serving righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. So what they're trying to say is, now that you're the servant of righteousness, you need to be free of sin. Not Andrew gets on a pulpit and tells everyone they're allowed to keep sinning. Not that. The opposite of that. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Is it eternal life? Is walking in sin, is the end of it eternal life? No, it's death. But now being made free from sin and becoming servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Which means if your fruit is unto unholiness, you will have everlasting destruction. The opposite of what this is saying. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
So the wages of sin is the exact opposite of receiving eternal life. So why is this guy saying you can go on sinning and the only condemnation you're going to face is from the authorities on earth or the devil? No, the condemnation you're going to face is an eternal condemnation according to Romans chapter 6, 15 to 23. And it's as clear as day. Not only that, but he reads it in these sermons and he butchers it and twists it so it doesn't mean what I just said it means. Now does that mean that you're free to go live in sin. I'll be dealing with this in more detail too. But no, even though God is not bringing His judgment on sin, Satan gains inroad to you through your sin. So if you go out and are living in sin, Satan is going to eat your lunch and... There you go. Here Andrew Womack says again that God will not condemn you for your sins, but the devil will eat your lunch on earth and pop the bag. In other words... You still get to go to heaven while you're living like a reprobate, but you're just going to face the devil in this world and then you're going to be glorified and receive eternal life. Don't worry. Don't, don't, don't worry that much because God's got you. He loves you either way, even if you sin willfully, even if you walk in rebellion. But the problem with that is Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Meaning, if you sin willfully, the atonement isn't even, isn't even going to apply to you. Basically, you go straight to hell. That's what that's saying. What's, what's awaiting you? A certain fearful looking of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall be thought worthy of those who have trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewithin he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Is it, does it say it's a fearful thing for the devil to eat your lunch and pop the bag? No. It doesn't. It says it's a fearful thing for you to fall into the hands of the living God if you sin willfully, people. If you've been deceived by this man, run. He is a liar. He is preaching a satanic doctrine of devils onto you all. And you need to repent and come out from that headship immediately. It's no good. It's absolutely no good. I would love to see Andrew Womack sit with me at a table live for the body of Christ and actually defend what he's teaching people against someone who actually knows what the Bible says. That invitation is open to Andrew Womack. So you do not want to live in sin. It's just stupid. Quit living in sin. But what I'm saying is God loves you, stupid. Amen. He's not holding your sins against you. But what I'm saying is God loves you, stupid. Amen. He's not holding your sins against you, but Satan will make you pay if you're living in sin, so quit doing it. 1 Peter 4.17 says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begins with us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? I motion the answer is the lake of fire at the end of all things. Wherefore, let him that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto, the faithful unto a faithful creator. So, 
This here doesn't sound like you have a license to do whatever you want and still go to heaven. Not, not at all, not even close. So I'm not sure why he teaches this. He's not holding your sins against you. But Satan will make you pay if you're living in sin, so quit doing it. Basically, according to what he just taught, repenting of your sins is just enlightened self-interest while you walk around on earth. It has nothing to do with, with what's going to happen to you in the afterlife and the judgment. And that's not biblical, people. Everyone needs to repent of their sins. Jesus said, repent or you will all likewise perish. He said, those who know his will and don't do it will be beaten with many stripes. It doesn't say that he's going to give you a, a mansion in eternal life. You are going to be judged more harshly if you know the scripture and you do not repent of your sins. I mean, God has awesome things in store for you, but it's not because we are special in ourself. Paul, I read those verses last night that in myself, you know, that he would not boast in anything in himself. So anyway, he says, Paul, I read those verses last night that in myself, you know, that he would not boast in anything in himself. So anyway, he says, for in me, I can tell you right now from experience, this man doesn't even spend an hour praying about what he's uh, going to preach on when he does these big events. He has no idea what he's doing. That is, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I, now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Man, I could spend all morning on this. I'm wanting to get past this to other things, but quickly let me just say that in the book of Romans, I forget the exact number now, but it's 40 something times that the word sin is used and out of all of those times there's only two times that it is a verb the other times it's a noun the difference between a noun and a verb a noun describes a person place or thing a verb describes what a person place or thing does it's describing action and when the word sin is used in the book of romans there's only two times it's talking about actions other times, it's not talking about what you do. It's talking about that sin nature, the sin that is in you. So this is what it's talking about right here. He says, it's not me doing it, but it's sin. It's that sin nature. And I wish I had time to explain this. I'm just going to say it and let it go. I hadn't got time to explain it, but in the sixth chapter, we do not still have a sin nature. When you get born again, your sin nature is gone. It doesn't exist. We do not still have a sin nature. When you get born again, your sin nature is gone. It doesn't exist. Right here, Andrew Womack confirms Paul is speaking of his own sin nature after he was already regenerated by the Holy Spirit. But in the same breath, Andrew says, he's wrong. After you're regenerated by the Holy Spirit, you no longer have a sin nature. So in other words, what he's saying is, he knows better than, than Paul the Apostle. In other words, that's exactly what he's saying right here. We do not still have a sin nature. When you get born again, your sin nature is gone. It doesn't exist. And yet some people will say, well, mine does. Because, man, it just seems like you're constantly driven to lust or to do something. No, your sin nature is gone, but it left behind an unrenewed mind. It programmed you how to think and how to act. And now the sin nature is gone. And now the sin nature is gone. But you've got to renew your minds. What it says in Romans chapter 12 Verse 2, it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Right here he's saying it's not the sin nature, it's not the flesh. You just need to renew your mind. But the problem with that is, 
We need to renew our mind because we have a sin nature. If we didn't have a sinful nature, we wouldn't need to renew the mind at all. Renewing the mind is forsaking the sinful natures of our flesh. We also must cast down every imagination that wars against God and understand that the flesh is where the sin nature resides. Paul is very clear that the root of the problem is the flesh and not necessarily in the mind when he clearly states, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh I serve the law of sin. The problem only becomes an issue of the mind when the mind comes into agreement with the law of sin and not the law of God. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You've got to, in a sense, reprogram your computer. Renewing the mind is simply bringing the mind into obedience with one's spirit rather than one's flesh. This is something the born-again Christian must do every day. The battle is not over when you are indwelled by the Holy Spirit, as Andrew Womack states when he says, the sin nature is gone for believers. Paul states in Galatians as he addresses the converted saints, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that ye would. Jesus states in the book of Matthew to his followers, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now at the end of the day, we all need to sit back and come to the understanding that Andrew Womack literally invented the fact that the flesh is no longer an issue for a born-again saint. He literally made that up. And when people listen to that and believe it, they no longer understand that they're in a war with their flesh, but they sit back and say, I have everything I need in Christ. I don't have to deny my flesh because I don't have a sin nature anymore. And then you know where you're going to end up? You're going to end up in hell. You must deny your flesh daily like Jesus Christ said. Who are you going to listen to? Jesus Christ or Andrew Womack? You've got to, in a sense, reprogram your computer. Your mind is like a computer. It was taught to be selfish. It was taught to lust. It was taught to be angry. It was taught all of this stuff. And it's going to continue to function the way it was taught until you reprogram it. So you got to take the Word of God and reprogram it. Anyway, I wish I had time to explain that. I'm going to go on. But it's not... This isn't talking about Paul, the man who wrote half of the books of the New Testament, being this schizophrenic person. That he wanted to do good, but he couldn't do good. And some people have tried to deal with this by saying this was before he got born again. It's talking about what happened. But that's, anyway, I'm not going to take the time to verify all of this. You can take it as andeology if you want to. But Anyway, I'm not going to take the time to verify all of this. You can take it as andeology if you want to. But No, this isn't talking about before he's born again. This is talking about even now that he's a Christian. But it's not his sin nature that's making him do it. It's just the flesh. No, this isn't talking about before he's born again. This is talking about even now that he's a Christian, but it's not his sin nature that's making him do it. It's just the flesh. Okay, brothers and sisters, I have a news flash for you. The sin nature dwells in your flesh. It's the same thing. In the flesh dwells no good thing. That's what the Bible says. Unclean spirits dwell in the flesh of men. When you're born again, your spirit is born again. Your flesh is not born again. Your flesh still has evil in it, propelling it to have that sin nature. The reason you have a sin nature is because you still have flesh. That's why this corruptible body must put on incorruption. The way Andrew Womack teaches, we don't even need an incorruptible body. We are already made holy. We already don't have a problem 
We don't have a battle with the flesh. We're already totally made clean in the eyes of God, even our flesh. Now, yes, in the inner man, we're born again. We're made holy. We're made righteous. We have the power of God. But that's why our inner man, our spirit, wars against our flesh. If you are a Christian and you're not living in this war, you are deceived and you're going to go to hell. Because every true believer will have a spirit that wars against their flesh. And that's why Paul says the two are contrary to each other. And that the flesh is propelling him to do things that he doesn't even really want to do. That's what he means when he's talking about that. Andrew Womack is all over the place on this thing. He just jumps around to suit his false doctrine, but he doesn't belong teaching on this topic. I'm surprised he even dug into this topic. But hey, God makes people do things that reveal their foolishness. Anybody who's watching this video, if you don't understand what I'm saying, you don't know your Bible either. And when the word sin is used in the book of Romans, there's only two times it's talking about actions. Other times, it's not talking about what you do. It's talking about that sin nature, the sin that is in you. So this is what it's talking about right here. He says, it's not me doing it, but it's sin. It's that sin nature. And I wish I had time to explain this. I'm just going to say it and let it go. I'm just going to say it and let it go. I hadn't got time to explain it, but in the sixth chapter, we do not still have a sin nature. When you get born again, your sin nature is gone. It doesn't exist. When you get born again, your sin nature is gone. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Here again, Andrew Womack, five minutes earlier, confirms Paul's talking about his own sin nature. Now he's again saying Paul the Apostle's wrong. It's not talking about what you do. It's talking about that sin nature. The sin that is in you. So this is what it's talking about right here. He says, it's not me doing it, but it's sin. It's that sin nature. And I wish I had time to explain this. To him. But it's not his sin nature that's making him do it. It's just the flesh. It's that sin nature, and I wish I had time to explain this to him. But it's not his sin nature that's making him do it. It's just the flesh. Now we're going to watch Andrew Womack skate onto a totally irrelevant topic, which is born-again Christians that are trying to serve God with their own strength. The whole sermon was not talking about that up until this point, but when he realized he couldn't explain uh, the issue of the sin nature, and, and he couldn't articulate it. He just changed the sermon, and he does it for about five minutes over here. He switches over to, don't try and serve God with your own might. Now, those verses that Paul was talking about had nothing to do with that, people. So why is he now talking about that? This guy can't even stay on topic. He traveled across the world to preach and if you guys want to pull this up, this is some of his latest stuff. Just go on his YouTube channel and pull it up. And you'll see that I'm not taking him out of context. This is really what he's teaching people. Our flesh is incapable of serving God. Your flesh is incapable of turning the other cheek when somebody spits in your face and slaps you. Your flesh is incapable of forgiving people. God has called us to do things that are beyond your human ability. The Christian life isn't just difficult, it's impossible. It's impossible. In yourself, you can't lay hands on the sick and see them recover. There isn't any of this power in your flesh, it's in your born-again spirit. This is just describing the, the conflict between trying to serve God out of your ability with your power versus doing it by God's Spirit. In Romans chapter 7, the word spirit is only used one time in verse 6, and it's not even talking about spirit like your spirit, soul, and body. It's talking about a mental disposition. But the word spirit isn't even used really in that sense in Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 8, it's used 21 times. Romans chapter 7 is a, is a chapter 
that describes the conflict and the pain. And this is where most Christians live because they aren't living by the spirit. But then in Romans chapter eight, it is nothing but victory. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. That's Romans chapter eight, verse one. And Romans chapter eight just goes on and talks about the spirit and how that the spirit gives life. And anyway, this is what I want to contrast. Now, we've already shown you that without Christ in your flesh, you are nothing. You have nothing. You can do nothing. You might be able to exist and do things compared to other people, but you can't do what God wants you to do. You can't live the Christian life in your own flesh and in your own power. Man, that is so profound. I just feel like it's hard to say that and just move on. But that, that is something that the average Christian doesn't understand. They may have good intentions and they want to glorify God, but they haven't yet learned to turn from themselves and confidence in themselves and depend upon God. They are still self-dependent. And that is a recipe for disaster. Some of the verses that I used last night, Jeremiah 10, 23, Oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself, it is not in man that walks to direct his own steps. God has given us the privilege of choosing whether to live by our own wisdom, our own intellect, our own ability, or to submit to him. He gave us that choice, and you can choose that, but it's absolutely the wrong choice. We need to learn to live by what God says. And so this is what Paul is describing, and he ends this seventh chapter in verse 24 by saying, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Did you know most Christians today would never say anything like that? But that is absolutely true of each one of us. In ourself, if you are not taking into account who you are in Christ and what he's done, every one of you ought to be able to say, O wretched man or woman that I am. In ourself, if you are not taking into account who you are in Christ and what he's done, every one of you ought to be able to say, oh, wretched man or woman that I am. What a mess that I am. God, it's amazing that you love somebody like me. And yet there's a lot of people that would never say that because you really do value yourself and think you're awesome. But this is the guy who wrote half of the New Testament. It's the attitude that he had, and I would su submit, submit to you that it's better than the attitude that you have. Amen. Dwayne's enjoying this. He's saying amen. Dwayne's enjoying this. He's saying amen. And then he answers his question in verse 25. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So in other words, the way we get delivered from this flesh is through God. And then Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Some versions will actually put a period there and leave off this second part. And did you know that that's correct in the sense that from God, now there is no condemnation to you. Even though your flesh is not capable of serving God, and in your flesh you constantly blow it. Some of you right now, the way you're thinking about me is wrong. <laughs> the things that you've said about me, about how could this be true, I think that guy's great. That's wrong. You know what? You just constantly miss it in your flesh. And so from God, because you've accepted Jesus, there is zero condemnation towards you. But there is still condemnation. It's just not from God. If you go out and live in sin, if you take what I say, and I'm going to start amplifying on this this morning and then again tomorrow, I know that Dwayne will be ministering on this a lot. But if you start taking your freedom and liberty in Christ and the authority and the love and the peace and the grace that God has given you and you start saying, man, now God loves me and so I can go out and live in sin. I can break the law. I can steal. I could rob a bank. And you know what? God will still love me. That is absolutely true. That is absolutely true. There is no condemnation from God over your actions. So I can go out and live in sin. 
I can break the law, I can steal, I could rob a bank, and you know what? God will still love me. That is absolutely true. There, that is absolutely true. There is no condemnation from God over your actions. There is no condemnation from God over your actions. As you could see, this is the most blasphemous thing I ever heard preached from a pulpit. If you go rob willfully, steal, commit adultery, all that, you are not in Christ Jesus. Therefore, there is condemnation. He's trying to say you could do all of those things in Christ Jesus, and if you're in Christ Jesus when you're doing those things, there's going to be no condemnation because you've, quote, accepted the Lord, like he said. But people, you are a child of the devil if you sin willfully. But if you take that approach, there still is condemnation. It's just not from God. I can guarantee you the police will catch you. They'll put you in prison. And you know what? While you're sitting in prison for the next 10 years, you could just have a wonderful relationship with God and you could feel the love and the peace of God as you rot away in prison. There is still condemnation against you. It's just not from God. You've got to recognize that sin was not only a transgression against God that has now been dealt with and God has taken away his wrath and punishment. He is not going to cease to answer your prayers because you have done something wrong. He is not going to cease to answer your prayers because you have done something wrong. 1 John 3.22 says, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Why do we receive things from him? Why are our prayers answered? Because we keep his commandments and we do what is pleasing in the sight of God. He is not going to cease to answer your prayers because you have done something wrong. If that was true, then James chapter 2 verse 10 says, If you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you become guilty of all. Anybody who preaches that you've got to perform and earn God's favor and blessing, His love in your life, they are inaccurate according to the New Testament because the New Testament teaches that you don't, if you keep 99 rules out of 100, you don't make 99, you make zero. You either keep them all perfectly or you fail the test. And if that's true, which it is, well then that means that nobody in here can earn the blessing of God. God placed all of your sin. And I wish I had time to teach on this. I don't know if I'll get to this this weekend, but God has even placed your sins that you haven't committed on Jesus. The sins that you haven't even committed yet are placed on Jesus. They're all forgiven. And I know there's a lot of people that think that's heresy. How can God forgive a sin before you commit it? Well, you better pray that he can forgive a sin before you commit it because he only died for your sins one time 2,000 years ago before you had committed them. When he died, all of your sins were future. God can forgive sins before you commit them. God has already dealt with sin. Your sin is not an issue between you and God. Your sin is not an issue between you and God. Your sin is not an issue between you and God. Our sin is not an issue between us and God. Even though God sent his son to die and save us from our sins, Andrew says our sin is not an issue between us and God. Yet the book of Hebrews says, without holiness no man will see the Lord. And the book of Matthew says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. What is this guy talking about? This guy's the biggest heretic. He's the biggest heretic in all of the whole world right now. I don't even hear people like Kenneth Copeland and Creflo Dollar preaching garbage like this. This is the worst I've ever seen. But if you think, well, man, then I can go live in sin. You're forgetting the fact that sin wasn't only a transgression against God. Sin is an inroad of Satan into your life. 
Romans chapter 6 verse 16 says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants you are, to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. Even though God isn't placing his judgment on you, it was placed upon Jesus, sin opens up a door to the devil. And the Bible says in John 10, 10, that the thief, Satan, only comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. If you go out and live in sin, God is not going to judge you for your sin. He already judged Jesus for your sin. If you go out and live in sin, God is not going to judge you for your sin. He already judged Jesus for your sin. If you go out and live in sin, God is not going to judge you for your sin. He already judged Jesus for your sin. But Satan will judge you for your sin. He but Satan will judge you for your sin. He but Satan will judge you for your sin. He, he will come in and destroy your life. And this is exactly what's happening to a lot of Christians. If you think that God is the one that's causing you to fail when you sin, then it's going to separate you from the love of God. But I'm telling you that God loves you in spite of who you are, not because of who you are. God loves you, period. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't make God love you more and you can't make God love you less. But you can go out and live in sin and there is condemnation if you are, aren't walking in the spirit. If you're walking after the flesh, Satan is going to condemn you. People are going to condemn you. The government will condemn you. The law will condemn you. There are consequences to your actions it's just not God who's judging you and rejecting you because of your actions. There are consequences to your actions. It's just not God who's judging you and rejecting you because of your actions. There are consequences to your actions. It's just not God who's judging you and rejecting you because of your actions. Man, this is awesome stuff I'm saying and things that most people don't know. Man, this is awesome stuff I'm saying. And things that most people don't know. So in verse 2, he says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. What's the law of sin and death? That's the law that when you sin, you get death instead of life. That's the law that when you sin, you get Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15 through 68. All of the curses instead of the blessings of Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14. In other words, you reap what you sow. But God set us free from that. I'm reaping what Jesus sowed as long as I put my faith in Him and trust in Him and rely upon Him. So the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had set me free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, through my flesh, your flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and forcing, condemned sin in the flesh. And verse 4 says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. We have now been set free from living out of our own self and out of our own ability, what the Bible calls the flesh. And we can now live out of our spirit. Now, even though before he said it's not the sin nature people, it's the flesh, now he's saying we're, we've been set free from the flesh. We have now been set free from living out of our own self and out of our own ability, what the Bible calls the flesh. We have now been set free from living out of our own self and out of our own ability, what the Bible calls the flesh. So sin nature's out, the flesh is out, and guess what's left, people? We're down to just renewing the mind. So this guy's just a false identity teacher like Dan Moeller and Todd White and all the rest. This is what this guy has become. He's probably always been this way. I didn't watch some of his earlier stuff all the way, way back when he first started. But it's very clear this guy's not led by the Holy Spirit. You don't start preaching people comfortable where they can live in sin after 20 years of preaching 
And then, you know, people are supposed to think that you're actually led by the Spirit of God. No, it doesn't work that way. We are at war with our flesh. That's the bottom line. The flesh is still a problem. The flesh needs to be dealt with. Now, up to now, you have ministered in the office of the teacher. But tonight, by the command of the Lord Jesus Christ, head of the church, I separate you to the office of the prophet. In Jesus' name. And every spiritual gift, every endowment from on high, necessary to carry out this assignment is imparted to you now from heaven through the earth to you. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise Praise God. God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, that's a confirmation of what God has told me that I hadn't walked in it, so I receive it. Praise, Praise God. Praise Thank Amen. you, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Right now, I'm so honored to have Jesse and Kathy DePlantis with us. Come up here, Brother Jesse. Yep, come on. And uh, praise the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. I love you, brother. You are a blessing. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I tell you what, Jesse is radical. Yes. He's too radical for some people. I've had some people criticize me for being friends of his, and I bet you you've had some people criticize you for being friends with me. Yes. <laughs> but you know what? I've had him a number of times, and I, I tell you, Jesse loves God with all of his heart, and to me, that's all that counts. Amen. You know, every one of us has something wrong. I tell people that if you came here looking for something wrong, I got something for you. Oh, and I tell people that if you came here looking for something wrong, I got something for you. <laughs> Real quickly, let me say that one of the reasons that I love to be around Jesse for many, many reasons, but you know, he's the only man I know on the planet who's believing God for more money than I am. It's true. He's believing for $6 billion so he can put up a satellite network and keep Christians from ever being kicked off TV. And I tell you, when you, when you hang with turkeys, you turn into a turkey. When you hang, hang with eagles, you turn into an eagle. And Jesse just is believing God, and it always stretches me. You know, six years ago in uh, September of 2012, this was bare ground. And in six years, we have spent $80 million cash. I did go into debt on this parking garage. I didn't intend to. That's another thing. But it just happened, and I'm believing God to get it paid off quickly. So enjoyable. Hallelujah. Let's give God praise for what he's done here today. Thank you, Jesus. Well, Creflo, we're going to claim you as a CBC instructor. Amen. <laughs> Isn't that a blessing? Father, we just pray for Creflo and pray that he's been refreshed today as he's given and stuff. And we pray that you give him deeper revelation, show him new truths every day. And we just thank you for being at work in his life and the things you have done, what you are doing, and what you're going to do. We thank you for that in Jesus' name.
Amen. You have to grow. You have to mature. If God, you know, I, now it's taken us just in the U.S. alone 40 million a year just to make bills, and I need 60 million. That's what I'm shooting for this year. And that's just the U.S. operation. We have millions that come in through England and Australia and Germany and Holland and other places. And uh, if God would have put that burden on me 47 years ago when I started and I had to have, you know, I figured it out, I have to have over $4,000 an hour every hour of every day since I started this message. I have to have over $4,000 while I've been preaching. So there you have it. This guy makes more in one hour than most ministries could ever hope to get in a month. And what does he do with the money? He teaches false doctrine all over the world that sends people to hell. You can remain in your sin. God wants you to be rich. God answers all your prayers. Nobody can be sick. All good news. He doesn't walk in the suffering of Jesus Christ that the Bible commands us to walk in. He doesn't. He's a liar and a deceiver. He's a fat cat. He's a slow belly, preaching lies. Preaching lies to all of the body of Christ, and he's getting away with it because he's not flashy, because he's got a big belt buckle on, and he dresses like he just came off of a ranch doing some work with cattle. Don't be deceived by his southern drawl, people. This guy is just as bad as all the rest that you just saw him hanging out with. He's just as bad as Jesse Duplantis, just as bad as Kenneth Copeland, he's just as bad as Creflo Dollar. And if these guys aren't false prophets, I don't know who is. You don't have to die sick. You don't have to die with all of these problems. You can just go to be with the Lord. You don't have to die sick. You don't have to die with all of these problems. You can just go to be with the Lord. But I, you know, I can look at you and if you're tolerating sickness and poverty and some poverty and some poverty and depression and stuff like that, that's not going to affect me because I understand you've got a choice and I, I can't force you. But when it comes to me, I can control me. Amen. And I am just not going to be sick. I refuse to be sick. I don't believe in being sick. I don't get sick. I don't believe in being sick. I don't get sick. I don't believe in being sick. You don't have to live with sickness. You don't have to live with sickness. Okay, real quick, let's, let's try and get through all of this because this is something I've dealt with as a believer. I've had people try and tell me about this guy's doctrine and how I need to believe it to be healed of my, my illnesses that I have. And they've sent me messages and I've asked them to pray for me and they don't want to pray and they, they can't heal me, but they keep telling me I need to believe God loves me to be healed and I need to believe that he never wanted me to be sick. And I would turn back to them and say that my sickness was the best thing that ever happened to my character. And then they would tell me, according to Andrew Womack, if I believe that way, I'm not going to get healed. So this is very near and dear to my heart. I want to go into some Bible on the issue and talk about how true believers can be sick, okay? Now, what are the dangers of this? The dangers, the dangers of it is it discourages people who love God and it makes them feel like they believe that they did something wrong because they are sick, okay? That's not always the case. John chapter 9, 1 to 3 says, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man or his parents had sinned, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. So the guy didn't do anything wrong, he didn't do any sin, and Jesus is saying he was sick so God could be glorified. So that crushes that doctrine right there, but let's keep going. Another danger of this teaching is it discounts the fact that God uses sickness to grow us in compassion. Now, before I got very sick, I used to think everyone that was sick did something wrong, that it was their fault, and I had no compassion on their illness. But now that I got sick, I know 
That I need to have compassion on other people and not be such a prideful little baby like Andrew Womack? I mean, I learned this in the first year of my walk, seven years ago, that we sometimes we're going to be sick, sometimes we might need doctors. This guy's been preaching 20-something years, had multitudes of sick Christians going through his church, and he's still preaching that a, a true believer that walks in true faith can't be sick. It's impossible. And that he never gets sick. So he eliminates that factor of how God uses it to grow people in compassion. Next, he eliminates the factor that God uses sickness to teach us how to cherish our temple. So some people abuse their own body, then they get sick, and God uses that to teach them not to abuse their own temple. Okay? He, he negates that factor. He negates the factor that it causes people to blame themselves for a test God has chosen to put them through for his glory. In the book of Job, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and still he hold, holdeth fast to his integrity, although thou moves me against him to destroy him without a cause? And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but only save his life. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot onto his crown. And this is the problem, people. The problem is Andrew Womack discounts the fact that this test could take place. Now, sickness is in the flesh. When we're born again, we're born of the Spirit. So Andrew Womack can't use the excuse, oh, now that we're born again, we can't be sick, because we're not born of the flesh. This is what the man doesn't understand. This is the problem. Yet God could use this as a test like he did in the book of Job. Another thing Andrew Womack discounts, the fact that God uses trials to strengthen us in patience, gratitude, and faith. God has used infirmity in my life to strengthen me in gratitude, patience, and faith. Romans 5, 3 to 4 says, But we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, slash faith, whatever you want to say. James 1, 3 to 4 says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So when you're sick, and you're almost sick nigh unto death, that works patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be per perfect and entire, wanting nothing. In Philippians 2, Paul has a fellow messenger named Aphroditus, which was sick nigh unto death. And, and Andrew Womack would just make it like this guy just didn't know his identity in Christ, didn't know who he was in Christ. These guys lived a walk that Andrew Womack couldn't even dream about walking. And these guys were sick nigh unto death in Philippians chapter 2, verses 25 to 27. Trophimus, I left sick at Miletus. Paul leaves someone behind sick at Miletus. 1 Timothy 5, 23. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Did he say, know your identity in Jesus Christ, you're going to be healed? No. He said, drink a little wine for your often infirmities. They, their prayers were not answered. He was not getting healed. Okay? Hebrews chapter 4, 15. 
For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. It says here that our high priest, Jesus Christ, was not beyond being vexed with infirmities. That's what this says. So Andrew Womack obviously knows better than Jesus Christ also. Maybe Jesus Christ didn't know his identity in Jesus Christ. Maybe that's Andrew's position. Next, God's angel strikes Zacharias dumb in speech in Luke chapter 1. So obviously God wants all people healed, right? When he sent his angel Gabriel to strike John the Baptist's father dumb in front of all men. Obviously, God wants people healed when they dragged Ananias and Sapphira out dead. Obviously, God wants people healed when Paul commanded blindness over a sorcerer in the book of Acts. No, God does not want all people healed. God uses sickness for his purpose. Paul had an illness, Galatians 4, 13-14. You know how through my infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at first. And my temptation, which was in my flesh, ye despised not nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 12, 7-9 And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations, I have a thorn in my flesh. It was given to me. It was a messenger of Satan sent to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it depart from me. And the Lord said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Andrew Womack will completely discount the fact that Paul prayed for a healing and never received it because Andrew Womack teaches that everyone's prayers get answered. So he, can, he has to totally ignore this verse. If everyone's prayers get answered, Andrew, why didn't Paul's prayers get answered? When you pray and believe God, God answers every prayer. If you ask, you receive. Everyone that asks, receives. God answers your prayer, but whether you see it manifest or not is not an indication of whether God answered your prayer, but it's an indication of whether you continued to stand until you saw what he had done manifest, whether you were able to resist the devil and fight off the unbelief and the things that he was fighting you with. But God has answered every prayer that has ever been prayed according to his word. He is faithful. He has never denied anybody an answer to prayer. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. But God has answered every prayer that has ever been prayed according to his word, he is faithful. He has never denied anybody an answer to prayer. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. But God has answered every prayer that has ever been prayed according to his word. He is faithful. He has never denied anybody an answer to prayer. There you have it, everyone. I think it's safe to say if you continue to follow Andrew Womack after watching this video, you're simply stupid. I don't see any other way around it. God's people are going to be lost out of ignorance. If you want to keep following this guy after I presented all that scripture and showed you the heretical things that he's saying, that's on you. Your blood is off my hands now. 
Andrew, if you're watching this, you need to repent in Jesus Christ's name and step down as a teacher. You need to publicly repent and remove all your heretical teachings from the internet or you will perish and be destroyed. You're going to be judged uh, way more harshly than the average Christian because of the amount of people that are following you. This is the problem when people raise themselves up as teachers. They pierce themselves through with many sorrows. And it's hard for a man that has the amount of possessions that you have, Andrew, to actually humble himself and say, everything I've ever taught people was a lie. All these teachings about repentance and how you could continue in sin, it was all a lie. You don't want to get up and say that. You don't want to get up and say that because it's, it's going to ruin your million-dollar empire that you built for yourself. But hey, the blood's off my hands. I did my part. I love everyone. I love Andrew Womack. I love all the people that follow him. But look, if you want to get up and put false teachings out into the public sphere... People have a right to scrutinize those teachings and correct them. And if that bothers people, you just, you're just an idolater. You just idolize Andrew Womack. And that's the bottom line. You might want to look in the mirror and realize you've put your trust in man and not in God's word. So be blessed in Jesus Christ's mighty name and have a good day.